All right, next up, uh, from Southern California, please welcome Rob Robert. Rob's the author of uh, three books, but his new one, The Cost of Living, is coming out soon. So, excited to have him here today. No matter how this goes, the achievement was actually getting up here without stepping on someone. <laughs> litigious times we live in. Um, <laughs> This is from a, a memoir that I'm working on uh, uh, called Your Life in Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. Your first girl, you, you have your first girlfriend and you are, as far as your 10-year-old self knows, madly in love. You have nothing to compare it to, so it is, in its way, love. Though looking back, it is a very young couple of kids having a very young couple of kids crush on each other. You were Renee's buddy in science class. That's how you meet. Because she's a bright girl who has been advanced a grade, and in theory, she needs an older student to help her fit in. And the principal, the man who knows you incredibly well from your frightening numbers of trips to his office, seems to have decided that it might be good for you to be responsible for once, to take care of someone and not get in trouble. On your 11th birthday, she's killed in the woods that back the three or four neighborhood developments around you, woods that you all played in. Her head is crushed with a large rock, bludgeoned is the word the newspapers use, and you have to look up the word and it will remain your most vivid memory of finding a definition in a dictionary. You are old enough to realize none of this is your fault, but you remember the principal telling you your job is to take care of Renee and the phrase will not leave your head no matter how much you want it to. For years you thought there were rumors, after all, that she was raped and then bludgeoned. She was never raped, you find out much later, though for many years in your head she was. The facts for years were not the truth. And now you have a new truth, but it doesn't change your reaction over the years at what you thought was the truth. You only learn that she wasn't raped when you try to research her case in your early 40s, thinking somehow that it might make your life make more sense if you could make some sense of her death. From that day in 1977, you never, especially until you leave your hometown at 18, look at a man without thinking it could be him. Every coach, every teacher, every stranger who ever walks by you, for years, you're horrified whenever you're left alone with a man. Sometimes without warning, you flush with rage and want to hurt a man you've never seen before. Your reaction to everything in the world begins to frighten you. Her case remains unsolved 35 years later. It will never resolve, and it won't reduce itself to meaning. She has been gone from this earth nearly six times as long as the time she was here. And sometimes, even though in the grand scheme of things you have known hundreds of people better, you think that she may be the most formative, important relationship of your life. Looking back, you see that while many things happened before Renee was killed, this is really where all the other things start and to a certain degree end. Um, oh, they're dated. That was 1977. This fall, 1984. You were diagnosed bipolar with rapid cycling and occasional psychotic episodes. You've been up almost a week and you don't remember any of what a friend later tells you you said and did the last two or three days you were awake. It was like a drunken, a drunken blackout, but longer and worse, since apparently you were acting, quote, pretty damn full-blown crazy, end quote, your friend says. His ex-wife is a schizophrenic and he thinks you may be one. He convinces you to see the college psychiatrist who sends you to someone else, and that doctor tells you you've been self-medicating for years from what you tell me, young man. The good news is you're not schizophrenic. The bad news is that you are pretty full-blown crazy. <laughs> Plus, you apparently have PTSD, which you thought only soldiers got. From this point, for a decade or so, you will only tell people very close to you that it's possible they may have to take you to a hospital someday. 
that you will not want to let them take you and that they'll have to ignore whatever you say at those times. This makes even the people closest to you tense about what it means to be close to you and you will hate yourself for it. Yeah. 1983. Why the sad boy a drink? 1983. You have scars you lie about and scars you tell the truth about. In the summer you're 17, you tell people, you got chased by several cops for over a half an hour through the woods of your hometown. The same woods, though you didn't think about this until they get, you'd gotten away from them, that Renee was killed in six years earlier. You don't even remember that they, why they were chasing you. You remember being drunk, you remember the woods being dark, and you flooded with adrenaline and fear and sprinting over the wet mossy stones and through the giant knuckled limbs of the trees. You hear them running behind you and you see the blur of their flashlights jumping up and down as they ran behind you. You turn to look back to see if they're getting closer <clears throat> and you get clotheslined by a thick broken tree limb. Your head and your chest stop and your legs fly out in front of you and you're instantly on your back and your head hits the ground hard. You have trouble breathing, but know you have to get moving. You run for another five or ten minutes and end up in tall grass in a dammed side of the lake. You can hide in there with your head just above the water. You listen for a while until finally the cops give in and you hear them grow more and more distant until you can only hear the crickets in the woods and the fish lapping out on the water and the feeding on bugs on the surface and you feel and hear your heart beating and you're breathing hard at first and then more calmly. You walk about a mile to a friend's house and see in her bathroom that you opened a slice across your collarbone so deep you can see the milky white gray of your bone and so wide you can fit your index finger into the cut and feel your bone through the cut skin and muscle. Touching the bone makes you queasier than looking at it does. She gives you a washcloth to press to the cut when you take it away and look in the mirror, you see the clean cut of the bone, and then it rushes and fills with blood again, and all you can see is the blood. And then you press the washcloth against it for a while again. This story is true. 1987. You have a round scar about the size of a quarter between your thumb and the forefinger of your left hand. White around the edges and a deeper red than the rest of your skin in the middle. People ask about it, and you tell them some guy was pissed at you, and he had a friend hold you down, and he burned you with a cigar. You will tell the same story for years, and people seem to believe it. You're a fuck-up, and you've pissed off a lot of very angry people in your life. But the story is a lie. You burn yourself in the same spot repeatedly with the cigarette lighter in your car. You sit in your car, and you see your breath in the cold, You've got the key, tur key turns to the electric, but not the engine is on. The car is dark. The street lights glow a faded, overexposed sepia yellow on the rounded hills of snow people have shoveled from their driveways and sidewalks. The Green Line train clatters in its tracks a couple of blocks away. You push the seat back and recline so much that you're almost lying down. You've learned already that you have to be very comfortable if the pain is going to feel good. You pull the cigarette lighter out, and it's glowing orange. You put your left hand on your thigh because you're afraid you'll jerk away from the lighter if you don't have to brace it against something, but your hand never moves. Your skin makes the same sound as Hawaiian lava does when it joins the surf. The first time, you're surprised that it smells so sweet and pleasant. You thought burning skin smelled horrible, but you were wrong. It's the body hair that makes the smell so bad. On the skin alone, they're not at all what people tend to think. And you remember this 20 years later when you get your first brand and the woman who loves you holds your hand and kisses you and you're not at all alone and you smell your burning skin again and you think of being back in that car by yourself. The pain flashes at first. Your whole body feels a chill shoot through it. And then it's as if the lighter were a drug of some sort, entering you at the burn and filling you with an incredible calm. 
A beautiful peace radiates from your hand throughout every cell of your body. You learn by now that, that what makes pain hurt is when you don't expect it or when you resist it. When you know it's coming, it's like the lighter in you make a complete circuit and the current flows through you beautifully. Fight it and it hurts like hell whenever the pain starts. Let it happen, you learn, and it feels good everywhere. Every jumpy, fractured nerve you have gets caressed smooth from the pain, and nothing in the world will hurt for a while. When the lighter loses its heat, you take it away from your skin. The windows are fogged up, and the street lights are more of an expressionist blur now. You light a cigarette and crack the window and feel the wonderfully cold air, and you smoke and let your head fall heavy and spent against the headrest. There is no tension left in your body. You breathe in the smoke deeply. It's years before you tell anyone what really happens. Now it seems ridiculous to you that you would have told some that you wouldn't have told someone that you did it to yourself. But you are not the same person you used to be, except of course when you are. Thanks a lot. <laughs>